OK, we are going to come back and kind of in the context of the Craig Gordon model that I briefly introduced, we're going to think about one of the and describe one of the fundamental observations in isotope hydrology, which is the global meteoric waterline. Okay. Did Turi introduce the global meteoric waterline? No. He did. Excellent. Okay. So let's start with equilibrium fractionation. And here's an important observation. At 20 degrees C, these are the epsilon values, the equilibrium fractionation factors for hydrogen isotopes and oxygen isotopes in that liquid vapor phase change reaction. And if you take those two numbers and you divide them, you get a ratio of 8. Okay. This is somewhat temperature sensitive. So for example, if you warm it up or cool it up, you're going to get a slightly different number. At 80 degrees C, the ratio you know, goes up to about 8. If you come down to freezing, it's more like 7.2 or 7.4. Okay. But the ratio of those two fractionation factors is about 8. So I ask you, if we take a parcel of air that's saturated with water vapor and we move it through the atmosphere and we cool it and it loses rain, right? it loses water to precipitation over time, what do you expect the relationship would be between the isotope composition evolution for hydrogen and for oxygen? What's the basis for hazarding a I guess here, proposing a hypothesis. Well, what kind of fractionation happens during condensation in the atmosphere? We talked about that. E equilibrium, right? Okay. We're dealing with water molecules that have hydrogen and oxygen in them, right? They're all, that's, that's the molecule, right? It's got both isotopes, and so both should be affected by the same processes. And I've just given you a kind of ratio of the fractionation factors, which should tell us right, the relative change in the two systems. So what's your prediction? What's the relationship? If we plot it up, if we followed that storm, if I got in my car and I followed this front uh, from here, this is a bad example, but you know, from uh, Oregon, where it was a couple days ago, let's just pretend, and across the country, what do you think, and I sampled the condensation along the way, I sampled the precipitation, I plotted up on a plot of hydrogen versus oxygen, what slope would I get? Eight, okay, that's all I'm looking for. I didn't realize it was a complicated question, but, right? So our prediction, just from first principles, from thinking about the fact that condensation is an equilibrium process isotopically, right? That H and O behavior is gonna be coupled in these systems and that these are the equilibrium fractionation factors is that we should, in a condensing air mass, the evolution of our isotope composition should follow an eight to one relationship, basically. Okay. So the, the global meteoric water line, you can plot it up many different ways. This is one example from a couple decades ago now. Bunch of precipitation samples. If you plot them all up, Right. Wherever you go and collect them, you're going to find a slope somewhere near 8. Okay. Now, you can go to a particular place, a particular environment, and get a slightly different slope. But in general, if you take a bunch of places and you plot them up, you're going to get a slope that's pretty close to 8. Okay. So we've described why that is. Condensation is an equilibrium process. So as air masses evolve, if the process that's really giving us variability in rainfall isotope ratios is this Raleigh distillation process, right? The rain out of water, equilibrium condensation, then we should expect a relationship of about eight. So we've solved half of the global meteoric waterline problem here. Why is the slope eight? It's because equilibrium uh, condensation is an equilibrium process. Okay? So then the other part of the global meteoric waterline is the intercept, and it has a value of plus ten. Plus or minus, okay? So why is the intercept of the global meteoric water line plus 10? Let's think about that a little bit, and it'll take us into this third parameter called deuterium excess, which is a very useful one. Okay. So in order to think about this, we need to come back to our Craig Gordon model and think about the factors that are going to affect 
the isotopic composition of the flux of water evaporating from the oceans in particular right, to the atmosphere. So again, we can think about this in terms of source and process. Isotopic composition of the source, if the ocean is the dominant source of water to the atmosphere through evaporation, what is the isotopic composition of ocean water? John knows. You're raising your hand? Zero. Zero, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so it's zero, right? Uh, ish. So zero, uh, Turi probably talked about standards, right? And the anchor point for our water scale is standard mean ocean water, which is not really ocean water at all, but it's a synthetic water that's been made to look like the ocean, more or less, okay? So we can think about the starting point, our source, as zero. Subtle differences from place to place, right? Parts of the ocean, the surface, I think Howie's going to talk about this. There's really cool stuff, like if you look at surface water isotope distributions, there's a lot to be learned there, but in general, it's about zero for our purposes here, okay? So if we're thinking about things that set the evaporative flux isotope composition, zero, zero, in hydrogen oxygen isotope space, that's going to be our standard mean ocean water, our ocean water source. And then we've got fractionation. And we said there's both equilibrium and kinetic fractionation. It's going to happen. Okay. And this is kind of a simplified equation describing the net fractionation uh, effect associated with evaporation. Okay. So we have two terms. We have an equilibrium fractionation. We're always going to have this equilibrium fractionation happening because we have to get the water molecules out of the liquid into the vapor phase, right? And in the Craig Gordon model, that's happening at this boundary between the liquid water layer and the boundary layer, right? Equilibrium process, saturated atmosphere, sitting over a liquid water. And then we also have the second term, which is our kinetic fractionation factor. Okay, and it turns out this one is a little harder to can, uh, calculate. It depends on the diffusivity of the water molecules with the two different, um, the two different isotopologues, uh, or the, I guess four different isotopologues, three different isotopologues we're considering here, right? So, um, uh, yeah, the three different isotopologues we've got. And it also, though, depends on other things like the conditions of transport. So how much turbulent transport we have versus... Um, how much diffusive transport in that kind of transition zone, the Craig Gordon model. So let's say we have it though, let's say we have an estimate of that kinetic effect, that kinetic fractionation factor. And the expression of that, this is very analogous to what you'll hear about when you hear about fractionation carbon isotopes in C3 plants. The degree to which that uh, kinetic effect is expressed depends on the humidity gradient, okay? Because diffusion is a bidirectional process, right? We've got a saturated boundary layer and undersaturated free atmosphere. Water molecules moving in both directions. The net flux, right? The diffusive fractionation, its expression is going to be proportional to the net flux out. Okay, and that's going to depend on the degree of undersaturation of the free atmosphere. So the H here is the relative humidity in the free atmosphere, right? And just keep in mind that that's one thing that this is sensitive to. The amount of kinetic effect that we're going to see in the net fractionation depends on the degree of undersaturation. Okay. And so then we are uh, adding this water to the atmosphere. And if we think about it, it's not this simple in the true atmosphere, but if we think about it, um, we're adding a flux of water molecules and potentially saturating this parcel of air, okay? And that flux and the isotopic composition are gonna be set by these factors. And then there's also a back, uh, back flux that we need to consider too, which I think I'll mention in a minute here. Okay. All right, so let's look at now the evaporation process, the evaporative process, and it's, impact or how, it, how it's expressed in terms of hydrogen oxygen isotope relationships. Okay. We saw that the equilibrium process gives a certain relationship. What's the slope of that relationship for the equilibrium process? Eight. Good. Okay. So there's our equilibrium process and it's happening here right at this boundary layer liquid water interface. So we would expect to see a relationship of eight to one in terms of the shift in values between the liquid and the boundary layer vapor, if we could go in and measure the boundary layer vapor. 
However, if we look at the kinetic relationship, what we see is that kinetic fractionation gives us a different relationship between hydrogen and oxygen. And in fact, it's about a one-to-one -one relationship. Okay? So kinetic fractionation right, during the diffusion of water molecules discriminates for hydrogen isotopes about the same amount as it does for oxygen. It's actually slightly larger for oxygen isotopes than hydrogen isotopes. Okay? So if we had a purely kinetic process and we looked at how that affected isotope ratios of water and we plotted up our data in hydrogen oxygen space, we'd expect to see the red line, a one-to-one -one relationship. Okay. Turns out in the real world when we put the two together and actually look at real world evaporation, combining the equilibrium effect that's always there with the kinetic effect, which is expressed differently in different systems depending on the conditions. Okay. We end up with a range of slopes, right, for evapor the evaporation process that goes between three and seven-ish, okay? I've got eight up there, but, okay. It tends to be a lower slope for soils, for example, where you have a porous medium and the diffusion is very, very well expressed because you've got a stagnant, you know, you have stagnant air in that soil column. So really the only way to move things is through diffusion. Okay. Uh, it tends to be a higher slope for you know, large water bodies that are exposed and there's a lot of wind and turbulent mixing. But we get a range of values. The slopes are lower than 8 okay, for the, if, uh, the effect. And so if we look at this, this gives us a lead into thinking about deuterium excess, which is a property of a water sample. We can characterize for any given water sample. Okay. which can tell us something about the amount of kinetic fraction